tonight, the search for a gunman who police say shot two people at random. They were completely and utterly innocent. One man is dead, a 16-year-old boy severely injured, both shot within hours near the same Toronto bus stop. Inflation is down for the first time in months. We did get a piece of uh, good news this morning. But Canadians are still feeling the pinch. I wanted to buy strawberries, and that seems like a luxury. When we could see an interest rate cut. And fears of starvation in Gaza, the UN suspends food aid in the north. This is the, the worst situation I have seen in my life. Later, the broader prospects for lasting peace. You have not just distrust, but even despair. We break down whether the two-state solution is still possible. From CBC News, this is The National, with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. There is anxiety tonight in a Toronto community after someone approached two random people on the street on two separate days and shot them. A 39-year-old father of four died. A teen is in hospital. Both, police say, were completely innocent victims who were simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. All that connects them is where they were, near the same bus stop in northwest Toronto. Jamie Strachan looks at where the police investigation stands right now. 39-year-old Adu Boache died doing what thousands of Torontonians do every day, waiting for a bus. Shot three times Saturday afternoon and left to die. Could happen to me, to you, to everybody who's waiting a bus. It was a classic case of wrong place, wrong time, police say. He was shot at random, the violence indiscriminate. The day before, at the same bus shelter, a 16-year-old boy was also shot and is in hospital. Police call his injuries life-altering. Both of the uh, victims uh, were uh, enjoying this community and uh, nothing in our investigation has shown that they are in any way affiliated to a gang or anything of that nature. Uh, they were completely and utterly innocent. Police say the two didn't know each other and don't appear to have known the shooter. The teenager was on his way to a volleyball game. Boache was on his way to work. He came to Canada from Ghana only last year. Mr. Boache was a father, an uncle, a nephew and a son. He leaves behind a wife and four children. This is a part of the city where violence is often woven into everyday life. But these random shootings, this violence resonates. It's around us and we don't know what's happening and we're just, we could be just waiting like him in the bus. Like right now, we're just waiting here also. It could happen to us also. There is now a police command post steps away from the bus shelter. Police also released a picture of a suspect and a stolen vehicle, since recovered, they say was involved. With all of this going on, there is also a resiliency in this community, people refusing to be defined by violence. I still find myself coming back into the community because it's such a close-knit community and like there's just a lot of like just beautiful people here. And Jamie, I can see you're at that mobile command center tonight, clearly a sign of the police presence in the community. For sure, Adrian. Police have been very busy uh, in this community since these shootings happened out on foot today, doing their best to reassure people. At the same time, the suspect and anybody else involved here is still out there. Police were asked today if this person could possibly strike again. They would only say it's hard to predict what someone who would shoot two people at random could do next. Adrian? Absolutely. All right, Jamie Strachan in Toronto tonight. Thank you. There's some welcome economic news today. Canada's inflation rate dropped last month to a seven-month low. So it's now at 2.9%, way down from the 3.4% it was in December. A decline that sharp was not expected. That doesn't mean day-to-day -day goods are getting cheaper, but as Kyle Bax explains, it could be a step towards the interest rate cut many are waiting for. No matter the material, fabric, wood or metal, expenses skyrocketed over the last few years for this Calgary mattress manufacturer. But now they're stabilizing. The cost of foam has actually fallen. That's gone down about 5% and foam's used in everything from car seats to mattresses to pillows. The latest figures released by Statistics Canada show the rate of inflation slowing to 2.9% in January. The first time it's been below 3% since last June. 
I think it brought good news to consumers, to businesses, and to the Bank of Canada, and we could all use some good news. Prices of clothes and footwear actually fell last month compared to one year ago. So did fuel. Food prices continued to climb, though at a slower rate. But rent and mortgage payments remain stubbornly high. Mortgage interest payments also went up by double digits year over year because when homeowners renew their mortgage, the previous rate might be 2%, 3%, and suddenly now they're paying 6% on their mortgages. And that's why, for many, it doesn't feel like inflation is slowing down. I'm not just working one job, I'm working three jobs just to make ends meet. Things are so expensive. Like, I wanted to buy strawberries and that seems like a luxury. We just can't afford to go for a meal for three people plus taxes and tip. Help could come later this year. If inflation stays below 3% and keeps falling, interest rates could also fall. We are optimistic that the Bank of Canada will uh, start bringing down interest rates uh, sometime this year, hopefully sooner rather than later, but that is their decision to make. In the meantime, no more price shocks are expected here. I feel like there's a bit of a stabilization, uh, at least uh, for the interim. Um, and, and I think that's going to be the course for at least 2024 and 2025. Making it a bit easier to rest with more predictable prices. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary. Part of what's driving inflated rental prices is short supply. Today, Ottawa is committing $2 billion in low-cost loans to BC builders to fast-track rental construction. This will support, at a minimum, eight to 10,000 new homes over the next few years, with more to come as even more land is secured. The federal financing matches $2 billion in provincial loans under its new BC Builds program, in addition to a $950 million investment. Underused public land will be the future sites of affordable rental buildings. So far, four locations have been confirmed. Now, rental prices in Quebec have long been known as some of the lowest in the country, but as early as this week, a law could be passed threatening the way tenants often keep rent costs reasonable. Alison Northcott now with more on the future of lease transfers in that province. This is my, uh, my kitchen. When Satya Ortiz Gagné was moving out of his last apartment, he yeah. wanted to transfer the lease so a new tenant could pay the same rent. To be able to refuse uh, an increase in the rent, I think it's the only tool that we have right now to be able to keep it just a little bit low. But housing advocates say that tool is about to lose its power. A new law that could pass as early as this week gives landlords the right to refuse lease transfers for any reason. Quebec's housing minister says the bill is meant to strengthen protections for renters. That was my goal, better protect the tenants against eviction so that they're not taken by surprise, that they, they receive um, a better compensation if they have to leave. Montreal was long known for having lower housing costs than other big cities, but rents have been rising. Ten years ago, the average two-bedroom was $739 a month. Now it's almost $1,100, up nearly 8% in the last year alone. Tenants' rights groups have been fighting Bill 31, arguing giving landlords more power could lead to more discrimination against certain tenants and other problems. It will take away uh, tenants' rights uh, to carry out lease transfers, which has historically been one of the few levers that tenants have uh, to keep rents affordable, uh, to support each other through what's become one of the worst uh, housing crises in Quebec history. Landlords argue while some parts of the bill will complicate their lives, having more say over who can take over a lease and when is a good step. Every year I have lease transfer and there's a disconnect when you look at the, the price that is paid for that unit and uh, what I would need to invest just to maintain that unit uh, viable. While there are lease transfers in other cities, experts say Quebec tenants have used them for years to try to keep rents low. Now some worry rents will just keep rising. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The mother of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny is demanding that the Kremlin release her son's body. Let me finally see my son, she said, appealing directly to Russian President Vladimir Putin in this video filmed outside the penal colony where her son died last week. She wants the immediate release of his body for burial. Russian authorities have not confirmed where they're holding the body nor his exact cause of death. 
Navalny's supporters believe the Kremlin is responsible for his death, a claim Moscow has denied. And a Russian pilot who defected to Ukraine last year has been found dead in Spain. Ukraine's military intelligence service confirmed the death of Maxim Kuzminov, but didn't say how he died. Spanish authorities said a man was shot to death last week in an underground garage. Media in both countries have identified him as Kuzminov. In Gaza, there is growing concern about hunger after the UN World Food Program announced it can no longer deliver aid in the north. The situation just too chaotic and too violent. And as Paul Hunter explains, this comes as the U.S. again blocked a Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire. In Gaza City, the Israeli bombardment continues. Its response to the Hamas attacks on Israel October 7th. Here, caught on camera by freelance journalists. But consider, too, these images. Beachfront, where word had spread that food aid had somehow arrived. Throngs of Palestinians went after it immediately, desperate for anything. Because we want to eat, said this man. We're dying of hunger. But the UN's World Food Program says even this is now at risk. It's pausing attempts to send food to the north, citing, quote, complete chaos and violence due to the collapse of civil order. Meanwhile, at the United Nations Security Council... The result of the voting is as follows. A vote on a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire put forward by Algeria failed. Vetoed by the United States. It says because a ceasefire now would threaten talks aimed at freeing some or all of the remaining hostages. This is not the time for this resolution which jeopardizes these efforts. We are extremely disappointed. The Palestinian ambassador to the UN said the veto's message to Israel, in his words, is to continue to get away with murder. Meanwhile, on the Egyptian side of the Gaza-Egypt border, Canada's Minister of International Development, Ahmed Hussein. We need an immediate ceasefire because that will enable more aid to, to go in and more vulnerable people to come out. For now, the vulnerable wait. Here in an overcrowded hospital in Khan Yunus, where there is no power, only flashlights and more misery. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Prince William is also weighing in on the war, saying in a statement that too many had been killed. And he called for an end to the fighting as soon as possible. He also said it's critical that aid gets into Gaza and that the hostages are released. The prince issued the statement after visiting the British Red Cross in London, where he spoke with staff stationed in Gaza. An unusual appeal from Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. He is asking Polish farmers to back off from a campaign that he says is damaging the war effort. Margaret Evans explains. Poland's farmers leaving no one in doubt of their views. Blockades organized all along the border crossings with Ukraine. And grain that did make it across into Poland, here summarily dumped. They say it's a protest against unfair competition in the wake of an EU decision to waive duties on Ukrainian food imports after Russia's full-scale invasion two years ago now. We don't have a breakthrough on international markets, says this farmer from near Lublin. We can't cope with the inflow of agricultural products, especially from the eastern border. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky calls the protests an erosion of solidarity with Ukraine. Only 5% of our agricultural exports go through the Polish border, he said in a video message on Monday. So in fact, the situation is not about grain, but rather about politics. Zelensky was visiting the front line near Kupiansk in eastern Ukraine this week after Russian troops took the city of Avdivka further south on Saturday. What's left of it, that is. 
Ukraine's fall counteroffensive failed to make headway against Russian lines, and Ukrainian troops are now fortifying their defensive positions, laying more dragon's teeth to stop Russian tanks and digging ever deeper trenches. If our allies were helping us more with ammunition, we would have been a bit more successful, says this soldier. He also says Ukraine needs more fighters. Boys, if you hear me, join the army, he says. Help us build fortifications, help us fight. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has called the capture of Avdivka a major success. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. And CBC News has learned that panic buttons have been offered to Canada's senators. The measure follows a string of safety concerns ranging from online harassment to tense encounters with protesters. I've been a senator now for two years, and even in those two years, I feel like there is um, anger and uh, aggression that is that seems to be unleashed now um, in a, in a in an increasing way. The buttons were first offered last fall. They're voluntary. Similar security measures are in place for MPs. And the RCMP is recommending a criminal negligence charge following a fatal crane collapse in Kelowna, B.C. in July of 2021. Construction crews were trying to dismantle the crane when it crashed into the ground, killing five people. It's now up to prosecutors whether to proceed. Dog attacks are on the rise in Toronto, and that is prompting calls for stricter rules for owners of dangerous dogs. Thomas Daigle now with what's on the table to tackle this growing problem. The cast on her arm and bandage on her face tell the story of a violent attack. Anita Brown was waiting for a bus two weeks ago when these two off-leash dogs pounced on her. What I go through... Everybody said they don't know how they would have survived this, but I thank God for being here still. And she's not alone in a city that can seem to have canines at every corner. Toronto is home to nearly 300,000 dogs. The vast majority of them are good pets, but the city has seen an increase in the number of dog attacks against other dogs and against humans. So officials are trying to figure out what to do about dogs that can pose a risk. A key city committee is endorsing a list of recommendations that would toughen rules for owners, including a plan to publish a registry of dangerous dogs. The city already hands out orders like these, listing the animal's name and breed and the reason they're being classified as dangerous. It's definitely necessary because owning a dog is a responsibility. I'm glad that they're kind of doing something about it now. What's more, the owner's neighborhood would be made public and they'd be forced to put up a new warning poster, not just a generic sign like this. It would actually have the City of Toronto logo on it and then there'd be a way to find out, you know, something about that particular incident. Vancouver outfits aggressive dogs with a unique tag, while in Montreal a special license is required for potentially dangerous pets. Good boy. Dog trainer Sid Mello says Toronto should consider posting a list of bad owners, not dogs. If it happens to one dog and that same owner gets another dog, you know, we're going to run into the same problems again. Yeah, they, they bite me here. As for Anita Brown, she's had stitches and is now waiting for surgery. Police are still looking for those dogs and their owner. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. The polarizing book bans we've seen in the U.S. are becoming more common right here in Canada. I expected the book to be banned in Florida. The pushback from authors and teachers, plus... The enhanced games are real. An athletic event that encourages performance-enhancing drugs is looking to become a reality. I don't think that athletes want to be the fastest natural man in the world. They just want to be the fastest. The planned debut and potential hurdles. And a wallet lost at sea turns up months later. I stopped in my tracks. Back in two. A major moment for Elon Musk's Neuralink. He says the first patient to be implanted with the company's brain chip can successfully move a mouse cursor around a computer screen just by thinking about it. 
The company hopes the chip can one day help treat brain disorders and injuries. The debate over book bans happening south of the border is gaining steam here in Canada, too. Deanna Sumanak Johnson looks at why access to some books has been restricted in this country and how authors are pushing back. At this school west of Toronto, keeping a well stocked library is about more than just education. This is not a really very advantaged community, and so a lot of my students aren't necessarily going to travel the world. And so books and story may be the only place that they're going to be able to do that. But maintaining that range of voices for kids to experience has been increasingly under threat. Late last year, children's author Danny Ramadan had his book taken off the open shelves in the Waterloo Catholic schools. It was only available upon request and with a librarian providing the Catholic context. The book, a tale of a Syrian-Canadian girl and her family, featured a character based on Ramadan himself, a gay uncle. I expected the book to be banned in Florida. I just was extremely shocked when I found out that it was banned uh, here. Librarians say the majority of challenges came from parents concerned about sexuality or gender diverse themes in books. There's even been a few cases where the challenges to books came from those very communities depicted in the books. That's what happened to author David A. Robertson's book, The Great Bear. Robertson is Cree and two Cree foster children are the heroes of his story. But some of the people who objected to it were also indigenous, saying the book perpetuated harmful stereotypes. As a result, the book was temporarily pulled off the shelves in the Durham Region School Board. Oftentimes, though, what happens is that the challenges come from a place where there hasn't been uh, a real in-depth study of the literature being done. And so it's coming from a place of ignorance. This expert says that no matter where the criticism comes from, Canadian school libraries have a robust review procedure that should be followed and knee-jerk reactions avoided. You know, we're not trying to defend every book to remain in the system, but what we want is people to go through the right process. Thanks in part to the media attention the bans got, both Robertson and Ramadan's books are now back on the shelves in the school boards that restricted them. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. A sporting event aimed at allowing performance-enhancing drugs is making some gains. As far as my athletic peak, history says that it's behind me. The enhanced games say it's not. How the competition would work. We've cut through the water with unmatched speed. And why many say this is problematic. The intentions and the realities behind the two-state solution. There is no realistic way of implementing a two-state solution. Why some say it is no longer possible as others say it's necessary. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Performance enhancing drugs have long plagued the Olympics. Now a proposed counter event wants to flip the script. As Jamie Strachan explains, the enhanced games wouldn't just allow supervised drug use, it would be encouraged. Canada's figure skating team in Beijing played by the rules. But even after a doping scandal, they were beat out by Russia. Why have I done this my whole life cleanly and correctly, the right way? The enhanced games are real. Now a new company's trying to change the game. We want athletes who have the potential to break world records and give them the opportunity to push the limits of humanity. I am the fastest man in the world. Self-described as the Olympics of the future, the enhanced games would allow athletes under clinical supervision to take substances currently banned. I don't think that athletes want to be the fastest natural man in the world. They just want to be the fastest. Backed by big money, including PayPal founder Peter Thiel, it's also promising substantial compensation. But would any athlete actually participate? As far as my athletic peak, history says that it's behind me. The enhanced games say it's not. Let's find out. 32-year-old Australian swimmer and Olympic silver medalist James Magnuson is the biggest name to express interest. I want to do this with the best doctors and medical professionals in the world to make sure that I'm doing it safely and properly. But most in the sporting world have ridiculed the idea. I think it's a horrific message. Including the head of Canada's anti-doping agency. There may be challenges or 
possibilities for improvement to the anti-doping regime, the answer to that is not to throw it away and suggest people compete using drugs. We've cut through the water with unmatched speed. Others call the idea preposterous, although it's hoped the potential competition forces the IOC to give athletes a greater financial stake in the Olympics. I really hope that what we are starting to think about is how we reward our Olympic athletes. The enhanced games will feature events like swimming and track and promises in inaugural games in 2025. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Now it's time to dig deeper into the news shaping our world. Hard facts on a long-held dream of peace, a two-state solution. Most UN member states do call Palestine a state, but the US, UK and Canada do not, even though they share that two-state goal. Ellen Morrow breaks down why all that support still hasn't made the dream come true. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is at its worst point in years. And so world leaders are calling for an idea that's been around for decades. We need to renew our resolve to pursue this two-state solution. We must never lose sight of how essential the two-state solution is. Live side by side in two states. A two-state solution. Two-state solution. The two-state solution means the creation of an independent Palestinian state that would coexist alongside Israel. It's long been seen as the best hope for peace, but it's never really come close to happening. And the reality on the ground now, after the October 7th Hamas attacks and Israel's military offensive into Gaza may make it more difficult than ever before. So is the two-state solution actually a viable option or just a talking point? Here's some of what makes it so difficult. One of the first big challenges is what would the borders of a Palestinian state even look like? To understand why that's so hard, we have to go back in history, but this is not a full account. We're going to take you through some of the pivotal moments in this long contested history. After the horrors of the Holocaust, the United Nations voted to establish the state of Israel as a refuge for the Jewish people in their ancestral homeland a decision that angered the majority Arab population. The plan was to divide historic Palestine, the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, which had been under British control, into two states, one for Jews, one for Arabs, with Jerusalem under international control. Jewish leaders declared the establishment of Israel on May 14, 1948. But five surrounding Arab nations rejected the UN plan and attacked Israel, the start of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. The creation of Israel and the war upended life for the Arab population in what Palestinians call the Nakba or catastrophe. Some 750,000 people fled or were expelled from their homes becoming refugees across the Middle East and in what's now the West Bank and Gaza. Today, some 5.9 million UN-registered Palestinian refugees claim links to that displacement. At the end of the war in 1949, Israel controlled more land than it had under the UN plan. Jordan took the West Bank, Egypt took Gaza. Jerusalem was divided, with Israeli control in the west and Arab control in the east. These armistice lines became known as the Green Line, still the internationally recognized boundaries between Israel and the Palestinian territories today. The Green Line is also known as the pre-1967 line because things changed in the Six-Day War between Israel and its Arab neighbors that year. Israel won, going past the Green Line. To this day, it has control of Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the Palestinian territories under a decades-long Israeli military occupation. So for Palestinians, the Green Line is the starting point for any negotiations on the borders of a Palestinian state. Because they want the Israeli military out. 
ending conditions that some rights groups have condemned as apartheid for denying Palestinians equal rights. Occupation is a daily reality of violence. Every aspect of your life is controlled by a foreign country. When and how Noor Oda is an author and activist in the West Bank, where three million Palestinians live under strict Israeli restrictions and surveillance. Whether I can travel from one city to another for work or to visit family is up to an Israeli soldier at a checkpoint. You could be subject to detention and you have no recourse for justice. But for Israel, the Green Line is a non-starter. Israel points out the Green Line was never meant as an official border, but an armistice line. And it says it poses a danger to its security, arguing the Green Line makes the country too narrow in places to defend. Its security fears heightened after Hamas militants stormed into Israel on October 7th. Armies of terror, if you wish, the Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, the Houthis, they're all basically attacking Israel militarily. This is an unbearable situation for Israel. It's an unbearable situation for any state in the world. Israel also doesn't consider the West Bank an occupied territory, but a disputed one. Israeli officials call it by its biblical name, Judea and Samaria, home of the ancient Jewish heartland. So there's a fundamental disagreement on what the borders should look like, and that creates a lot of other challenges to the two-state solution. These are one of them, Jewish settlements supported by Israel all across the occupied West Bank. Closed off communities where more than 500,000 Jewish settlers now live, built on land internationally recognized as Palestinian. The West Bank is seen as the heart of any would-be Palestinian state, but this map shows you just how much of that land the settlements are taking up. It, it's effectively rendered the West Bank as, as a patchwork of non-contiguous territories. So I think lo logistically speaking, there is no realistic way of, of implementing a two-state solution. The settlements are considered illegal under international law but Israel denies they're a violation, approving and funding settlement development over decades. Settlers say they have a religious right to the land. What is pushing us is thousands of years of history of longing to this land. But for many Palestinians, the settlements have meant forced displacement, a loss of resources, even violence with some extremist settlers targeting and intimidating Palestinians in sometimes deadly attacks. Extremist settler violence carried out with impunity, settlement expansion, all make it harder, not easier, for Israel to achieve lasting peace. And then there's the issue of occupied East Jerusalem a bitterly contested place, home to holy sites for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. If people can acknowledge that all sites have legitimate claims, whether they're national or religious, then there might be hope. Instead, Jerusalem has often been the scene of violent confrontations, and many of them have happened here. To Jews, this is Temple Mount, where ancient Jewish temples once stood. Just outside is the Western Wall, a sacred prayer site, the holiest place in Judaism. To Muslims, this same place is called the Noble Sanctuary, home to the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, where Muslims believe the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. Palestinians see East Jerusalem as the capital of any future Palestinian state. It's considered part of the occupied West Bank under international law. But Israel claims all of Jerusalem as its unified and eternal capital. Jerusalem has been the capital of the Jewish people for the past 3,000 years. There have been settlement disputes in East Jerusalem, too, and battles over land that have displaced Palestinian families. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No. With settlers filing lawsuits for land they say belonged to Jews before the 1948 war. 
Palestinians say it's all part of an effort to push them out of the holy city. Jerusalem's future necessarily requires sharing as opposed to the dominance of one group. That is a recipe for continued violence. So a two-state solution would require some kind of agreement on the status of Jerusalem. And that has been a major hurdle in the failed peace talks of the past. Up next, how the peace process came crashing down and what it means for the two-state solution today. When we've seen these repeated failures time and again, you have total, not just distrust, but even despair. The current leaders of Israel and the Palestinians are among the obstacles to a two-state solution. Ellen Morrow shows us how things got to this point. Another day of protest and violence on the West Bank. In 1987, Palestinian anger over decades of occupation triggered the first intifada, or uprising. It started out with protests and boycotts before turning violent. The Israeli military cracked down. More than a thousand Palestinians and 160 Israelis were killed. But as the violence was going on, something extraordinary happened. The two sides started secret talks, leading to what seemed like a big breakthrough. The signing of the first Oslo Accord in 1993. Today, the formal end of the long blood feud between Israelis and Palestinians. A moment when hopes for peace and a Palestinian state were high. Yasser Arafat's Palestine Liberation Organization recognized Israel's right to exist in peace. Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin agreed to the creation of the Palestinian Authority to run parts of the West Bank and Gaza. That was unimaginable just less than a year before. As Israel's deputy foreign minister at the time, Yossi Balin helped start those secret negotiations. But on the other hand, I was very worried. The picture which I saw was a picture of a peace treaty signed by two enemies. Well, this was not the case. That's because Oslo didn't actually solve tough issues like Jerusalem or what would happen with Palestinian refugees. All that was supposed to be worked out later, but it never was. And attacks from extremists on both sides made everything harder. The prime minister with a vision for peace, dead. Rabin was assassinated by a far-right Israeli student. And Hamas, founded in the first intifada, launched a wave of suicide bombings in Israel. In 2000, Arafat and then-Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak tried to salvage things, but they got nowhere. When we've seen these repeated failures time and time and again, you have total, um, not just distrust, but even despair. Frustration over the failed peace process set the stage for this, the even deadlier second intifada. Once again, Israelis and Palestinians fought in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Suicide bombings and attacks targeted Israelis. Israel deployed military force against Palestinians. 3,200 Palestinians and 1,000 Israelis were killed. The second intifada put the conflict on an even darker path, making many feel peace was impossible. Israel, shaken by the attacks, built a separation wall, added more checkpoints, more restrictions on Palestinian movement. So the failure of the peace process brought hopes crashing down, pushing the two sides even further apart. And that's reflected in their leaders today, leaders who experts say pose another hurdle to a two-state solution. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu came to office for the first time in 1996 as a critic of the Oslo Accords. While at times Netanyahu has expressed support for the two-state solution, he's also repeatedly argued against it, saying it would endanger Israel's security. It will not give us peace. It will bring terror closer. And I am also proud of the fact that I have made the creation of a Palestinian state. Netanyahu's latest government is also considered the most ultranationalist in Israeli history. A fragile coalition propped up by far-right cabinet ministers, Itamar Ben-Gavir and Bezalel Smotrich. 
both settlers in the occupied West Bank who deny the existence of Palestinians as a people. On the Palestinian side, you have two rival factions. There's Hamas, designated a terrorist group by Canada and other countries, and Fatah, the political party of Yasser Arafat that runs the Palestinian Authority. In 2006, Hamas beat Fatah in elections held in Gaza just months after Israel withdrew from the territory. Then in 2007, there was a brief civil war. Hamas violently pushing Fatah out of Gaza entirely, taking full control and running Gaza ever since. Israel then tightened restrictions, imposing a total land, sea and air blockade upheld in part by Egypt. Some rights groups say it turned Gaza into an open air prison. But Israel says it's necessary, with Hamas rejecting Israel's right to exist and vowing more attacks like October 7th. I know the world is very upset of what Israel is doing in Gaza, but what do you expect from, from a democratic country? How should a democratic country can protect its own people? As long as Hamas is in power, it's a complete, complete disaster. But to Palestinians who support it, Hamas is a legitimate resistance movement against the occupation, one becoming more popular in the West Bank, where rival Fatah is based. There is a lot of raw pain right now. People will side with whoever is seen to be punching back. Fatah is led by Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. The Palestinian Authority is backed by the international community, and Abbas says he supports the two-state solution. But to many, the Palestinian Authority is too weak, and Abbas himself has been criticized as autocratic, in charge since 2005. Polls suggest more than 80% of Palestinians want him to resign. With the right leadership, you'd have uh, a, a chance of managing, if not resolving, most if not all of the challenges. You need leaders on both sides who are masters of their political houses, not prisoners of their ideologies. You do not have them. So there are so many very difficult and deeply rooted challenges to the two-state solution. Still, some find ways to hold on to hope that somehow all this suffering will end. Even at such a tragic crisis, new opportunities are created. I'm a Palestinian. We don't have the luxury of not having hope. It won't take too long before people will get back to their senses. In the end, Palestinians will have a chance to be free. Whether I see it or not, I hope I'm that lucky, but I don't know. So Ellen, uh, we know what the leaders say, we know what the challenges are, but but can you give us a sense of what people on the ground are saying? Well, there's opinion polling, Adrian, from after the war broke out. In one poll, 65% of Israelis said they don't want a two-state solution. Now, that's a near complete reversal from where the numbers were a decade ago. Uh, in a Palestinian poll, 74% of people said they want a Palestinian state across the entire land. And those sentiments are yet another challenge to the two-state solution. All right, Ellen Morrow, thank you for this. You're welcome. Stay with us. In just a couple minutes, we're going to lighten the tone with tonight's moment. That's up next. This is Marcy Callowart. In her hands, a wallet she thought she would never see again. That's because it was lost in the water during a canoeing trip last summer. But eight months later, it found its way back to her, washing ashore near Tofino, B.C., Tonight, that unlikely retrieval is our moment. You're not gonna believe what I just found washed up on the beach. Guys, it's my effing wallet that went overboard last year. I stopped dead in my tracks. My heart skipped a beat. I was so excited. I dropped it while getting out of our canoe. And when I got into town, there was no wallet in my bag. That's when I had this sinking feeling um, the wallet had gone overboard. And I spent 250 bucks to have a diver go look for it. He was down there for an hour. He padded down the entire seafloor and he came up empty handed. The next day I gave it a shot. 
We're gonna go try to save a few hundred bucks. I was really excited when it did show up. I couldn't open it right there because the zipper was corroded. So I took it home and he used a steak knife to get into it. There was $20 in there. The coins have gotten pretty grungy and gross being down there, but I'm gonna keep them as for sure as good luck charms. So uh, she says, even though she had a sinking feeling, she also kind of thought it might come back because of the way the winds blow from the southeast uh, all winter long. They just keep pushing up the stuff from the bottom of the sea floor there. So every day she would walk on that beach and have a little look. And lo and behold, it came back. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.